Hi everyone. Um, thanks for staying. I know it's it's the last talk of the evening, but um, I'm, my name is Gaurav. I work in the WhatsApp Android infra team, and I'll be talking a little bit about performance and how we manage to make WhatsApp performant and reliable. And after that, Ruzbe will come and talk about one specific case study that that has helped our app. How many of you use WhatsApp? Can we do a show of hands? Okay, awesome. So I don't need to explain what it is. Um, so this is WhatsApp's mission. Right? We want to connect the world with simple, reliable, and private messaging, communication. We started off as a messaging app, and then we added calling and a few other features. Um, so a lot of why WhatsApp is fast and, and reliable comes from the values. And so I'm going to go over the WhatsApp values. So we have four values, focus, simplicity, quality, and privacy. Today I'm going to talk mostly about simplicity and quality. Um, so yeah, let's dive into simplicity. So we have certain design principles we follow. One important one is that we want to prioritize our users over our developer experience. In Miguel's words, who's sitting in the back, we're willing to get, take punches as developers. Uh, we want our users to have the best experience possible, right? And, and you'll see that we do things in, in slightly unconventional ways. Like, there's a lot of um, apps using a bunch of frameworks, um, interesting patterns. So I used to work at Facebook for five years before I joined WhatsApp, and, and Facebook builds a lot of interesting technology. But WhatsApp has actually tried to use conventional patterns, standard tools, so Android Studio, Gradle, um, and in many cases, very crude ways of solving problems because those ways are very effective. Right? So we've looked at dependency injection frameworks, but we actually found that a manual DI framework implementation actually works better and performs fairly well. Uh, in some cases, we'll do raw SQL instead of ORM or, or multiple layers because we see that it performs better. And as we try to use fewer libraries unless the libraries are adding significant value. So going into our stack, it's a very vanilla Android stack. So activities, fragments, views, um, just you know the regular stuff. We don't have um, a UI framework like React Native. Um, we use the standard Android async tasks to do async work. We use the standard HTTP implementation. We use the SQLite. APIs that Android provides, and as I mentioned, like sometimes raw SQL, um, it's compiled against Java 8. And so we don't use a lot of these other frameworks that, that some apps do. Um, there are some frameworks that we do use, and I'm just going to go over them, right? So we use ExoPlayer for videos, Protobuf for data serialization. Uh, our encryption protocol is the Signal implementation, which, which comes from the Signal Foundation. And their library is LibSignal, which is open source. Uh, we use Fresco for image rendering. Profilo and Stetho are performance and uh, debugging tools. Uh, we use ProGuard and Redex as sort of post-compile optimization steps. And um, yeah. so just going back to like, we want to keep the app simple. We want fewer layers of, of implementation makes it easier to reason about things. And we've stuck to vanilla Android. That also gives us benefits as, as the OS knows how to optimize things. The second quality I'm going to, uh, the second value I'm going to talk about is quality. And um, for us, quality means a few things, right? It means making the app performant. It means making the app reliable. It should do what you expect it to do. It shouldn't crash. Um, making it efficient, so it shouldn't use too much data. Um, it shouldn't use I mean, it's, it's okay to use memory, but it shouldn't use memory to the detriment of performance or other apps. And we also want WhatsApp to be fairly consistent. So people around you, if you all have the same app version, you should kind of get the same experience. So what did it take to get there? Right, so we, we make it work on low-end devices, and a lot of people at WhatsApp use low, lower-end or older phones. And when we build product, we test on those phones, and we want to make sure that, that the UI works on small screens. Uh, we monitor crashes and ANRs, application not responding. 
events very closely and we don't launch releases until we fix those ANRs, right? So someone from our team is watching them, the engineers get notified and, and we will go out and fix them. And we'll prioritize bug fixing over features. So we'll hold back features. Uh, it's very rare that a developer will say, hey, I can't fix this high firing crash because I have a new feature because that's just not part of our culture. We believe features should work and we'll spend a lot of time getting features to work to the point that it, it's, it's almost delightful, right? So the stickers feature, I think it took about a year from when it was first implemented till when we launched it because we just spent many cycles iterating it, making sure stickers work when um, you, know, you have two stickers next to each other, um, trying to figure out whether they should have rounded edges, trying to figure out like, should we have transparent stickers? So there was a lot of thought and, and detail in, in building that feature. And, um, and we'll slow down develop development. So like, uh, I will talk a little bit about app size and, and uh, we have turned down features and asked feature developers to optimize their code um, and not increase the APK size and, and those features have had to wait. Another thing I wanna talk about is A-B testing in, in production. So I've worked at Facebook where we do a lot of A-B testing and there's, there's a lot of value in, in the insights we get. Um, WhatsApp has chosen a slightly different path where it's more limited in, in the A-B testing. And we, like I said, we don't want people getting different experiences. It also has the side effect that most people are, are going through the same code paths so that code path is well tested, right? And, and when we're doing optimizations, um, most people are going through that same code path. So you're optimizing these, these very frequently hit code paths as opposed to 60,000 versions of, of the same path. Um, and we also make certain design choices that have helped lead to, to, to quality, and I'm gonna go into those. By the way, um, I can take questions in the middle if you'd like. So, so feel free to you know, raise your hand and ask questions. So I'm gonna talk about some of those design choices. Um, size matters. And uh, we have chosen to keep WhatsApp a single DEX app. What that means is all of your Java code compiles into, so, so Android apps have these binaries called DEXs. Um, and we've made sure that our app stays within a single binary. And uh, what that means is that we have to limit the app to 64,000 methods. Um, we've also done a lot of work to keep the app size small. A lot of our users are in markets like India, Brazil, Indonesia, um, a lot of countries outside North America. And um, they have different phones, they have different internet connections. So keeping the app small is, is really uh, valuable to them. So single decks is a really interesting constraint because in addition to keeping the app small, it, it means that there's less code that executes. So when you start the app, it just has to load up one dex. There's a limit to how, much, how many pages have to get loaded into memory, how many pages have to get read from disk, and uh, how many initializers or static initializers get called. So just by doing this, we're making the app faster. It also makes it easier to reason about code. So, few, so less code in the app means that uh, developers can actually understand what's going on. And when we have issues, it's much easier to debug them. It's also harder for bugs to creep in, right? Just having tighter and, and, and better understood code. And it forces us to be judicious about frameworks. So this sort of goes back to why we don't add a lot of frameworks. One reason is the, the complexity and black boxes, but the other part is this. Each framework means there's more code, more APK size, more method count. Um, and yeah, it forces code cleanup. Developers are incentivized to do that, right? So, so this constraint has led to a bunch of performance and reliability benefits. So another choice we've made is around the architecture, right? So a typical app, um, follows a server-based architecture. So all of your data, your images, and your database sits on a server, and these clients connect to a server. They might pull down some of that data. Um, often these clients can get thrown away. You can uninstall, reinstall the app, and they'll just pull what they need from, from a server. 
And so Facebook, Messenger, Instagram, and, and most popular apps out there follow a server-centric architecture. So WhatsApp does something different. It, it spins this around and says, we want all of your data to be on your device. It's a client-centric architecture. So your database, um, your media, everything is on your phone. And the server is just a router that gets data across to the other device. Once that data gets, once your messages or media reach the other person, it, it gets deleted from the server. What this means to us is that we have to be way more careful about bugs. We have to be way more careful about data loss, which is, again, goes back to why we would never ship anything that knowingly crashes, right? If, if we know that there is code that's been written, that's crashy, that can lead to data loss, we just can't afford to, to do that, right? So again, a design choice that forces certain um, a, a reliability bar. Another design choice is um, our app is written in a way where we block on the database, not on the network. So our UI writes to the DB, reads from the DB. Um, when you send a message, it just writes to the DB and asynchronously there's another thread that's going to pull that message out, send it over the network. That's when you'll see one, I guess you'll see maybe one or two ch checkboxes. Um, once it gets a response, that's when it'll notify the UI and the UI will update itself. But it has this really nice side effect that the app just works when you're offline. Right? I've been in a flight and I'm, I've basically scrolled through WhatsApp for an hour looking at messages and media because it's all local in the database. Right? I'm, and I'm not blocked on, on the network. It also has this other nice property that um, when you're using the app, it looks like it's fast because you're sending messages and you're just waiting for the DB. You're never waiting for the network to come back. Uh, it also helps us with um, testing our UI and, and business logic because we just have to simulate different databases, right? And so sticking whatever we want in the DB gives us the ability to test all sorts of UI scenarios. Uh, but it has the downside that the DB can become the bottleneck, right? And um, hence, we've done a lot of work on optimizing SQL in our app. Again, goes back to what I said about sometimes writing raw SQL. Um, We've done a lot of work to measure when our SQL queries are taking a long time. Um, different phones have different versions of SQLite and obviously different types of uh, devices, different, different disks. So there's a lot of, this has put more load on us in terms of optimizing how we're using SQL. So I've given you sort of a overview of, of some of the things we've done that have led to performance and reliability. Um, I also want to call out that when there's a lot of value in a framework, we will use it, right? And, and I, I listed some of the frameworks we've used. Um, when there's a lot of value in a framework, we'll build it, right? And so Roosby is going to talk about string packs, which is one framework we built because the way it was done by Android just didn't work for us, and, and we reaped tremendous benefits. So with that... Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm Ruzbek Purnader. Uh, I at, work at WhatsApp as an internationalization engineer for about two years now. Before this, I was at Google for about seven years. I've been doing internationalization all my professional life uh, for more than 20 years now. So I'm kind of secondary Android, although I, I was at Android team at Google for about three years, worked with uh, some of the people who gave the keynote speak. Uh, similar problems, I've worked at Google for this, but basically what happened when we, uh, when I came to WhatsApp, one of the major projects was the APK is too large, a lot of it is strings. How can we solve that? What can we improve? And of course, we looked at everything. So uh, in order to kind of define the problem, I want to give you a little about what the context of this was. Uh, we distribute our APK in kind of a, a slightly different way than others maybe. Of course, Google Play Store is there where everybody can download things and we know all the benefits there. Uh, but we also provide our APK on the website. Uh, it's a single APK for all the architectures and all the languages. And the idea is you get this, uh, you may not have good internet connection, you may not have some situation, you want to install it somehow on your device, you should be able to. And 
practically in developing countries in India, in I assume Indonesia, I know uh, clearly in Iran, there are people who don't know necessarily how to install something on their phone. They go to shops, they ask, okay, I want WhatsApp on this thing. And the shop itself may also have not necessarily a very good connection. They may just, uh, they have an APK of WhatsApp, they would just, with ADB or something, they're just gonna install it on the phone for the people. So this kind of distri offline distribution may also mean there's gonna be a wild variety of APKs out there. Those also need to be small. Those also need to have issues that works. At the same time, this is supposed to work on pretty old phones. So ice cream sandwich is, I, I mean, I don't know, raise your hand if your uh, app works on ice cream sandwich. Nobody? Okay, Miguel, that's my boss. <laughs> So, <laughs> so, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, so, there are phones out there. They rely on WhatsApp. Uh, we don't want to lose those people. And there's nothing that is kind of really stopping us to to serve those users. So we continue to serve them. And uh, uh, as Gaurav kind of hinted to, this is actually has helped us be very efficient on high-end devices. By working on low-end devices, we've made sure that it works well. But this is the context I was kind of working with. Uh, again, on top of this, we support 58 languages. All of them are in the APK. Uh, this is, uh, if, you, if you've played a little more with Android, that you, you know, especially in the later versions, you can choose the country. So, uh, maybe in Austria they do months differently than Germany. Maybe in Colombia they do numbers differently than in Mexico. So we also have information, for example, for formatting or some information for all these locales. This is the, the number of different locales we actually have information in the app to support. So there are some internationalization strings there for all of these things. And we all that kind of exists mostly because we needed to support the old Android versions. So if you're working on ice cream sandwich and you want to, I don't know, support some kind of currency display, the currency may not have even existed at that time. The, the, the new currencies that countries continue to introduce new currencies, uh, devalue the old currencies, uh, drop some zeros, all that stuff. We need to have latest information about currencies, emoji, whatever. And that's also all the information about that we need to carry basically in our app in order to work. That added to this kind of number of strings that we need to support. Uh, we extract most of that information from CLDR, which is a project at the Unicode Consortium, the Common Local Data Repository. That project drives what's in Android itself, that drives what's these days in iOS, what's in Windows. Uh, almost every major player in the industry that has a library formatting dates, formatting numbers, parsing those kind of things, uses this data. Again, usually the older version exists on your phone, we carry the latest where we can. It's a relatively uh, feature-rich app, so now it has more than uh, 3,500 strings. Uh, some of them are limited to some languages, we have features limited to countries, uh, stuff like that, so it's, it's not a fully uh, 58 by 3,500 matrix. Some strings in there are empty. And we also have a language switcher. Basically, we cannot rely on the Android phone to have a visible enough language switcher, so the user can't really necessarily go find deep in the settings where that thing is. And if you may know that some phones actually remove uh, some of the languages. So you, I mean, my, my work Samsung phone, uh, I think it's a uh, uh, Galaxy 8, uh, when I go to settings, it just gives me like eight languages to choose from. Although it has all the data for the other languages. The fonts are there, uh, the translations are there. Samsung for some reason decided, okay, this is too complex for users if the list is too long. At least for the, maybe the US market, I'm just gonna show them eight languages. We have users basically who get these phones, who buy these phones second-handed maybe. We want them to be able to choose a language. So that's why also we have a language switcher. So, and it works offline, as Gaurav was just saying, all, ev almost everything works offline. You just, it's, it's a very rich client, so everything is kind of there. So in this context, we had a very large APK, and we need to reduce it, 
And then Android, which is kind of default string formatting, was really in the way. It, I mean, to be honest, they have a problem that's very hard to solve. The, the, I mean, if you're familiar in, inside the APK, there's this file resources.arsc, uh, where it holds all your strings and diamonds and whatever, and this needs to be backward compatible. You can't really say, oh, I'm, I have a new idea, I'm gonna optimize this. It's not gonna work on ice cream sandwich because you cannot change the reader of the APK anymore. The ice cream sandwich still needs to load your APK, do everything you need. So if I'm at Google and I have this fancy idea about how to reduce APK sizes a lot, I can't because the format is kind of fixed because the readers are fixed. Uh, it also supports other things that bloat it a little. Uh, numbers are an example of that. Uh, if you look at the format itself, it's, it's a kind of a large matrix and there are empty cells are not very good for it. Uh, if you increase the number of strings, the inefficiency kind of increases. Google has tried improving this situation uh, AAPT2 improves some of it, uh, but basically if your mean SDK is 26 or more, only that that kicks in. Basically the reader on API 26 is has a second mode that can read this kind of newer ARSC format. We can of course use that because we work on all devices. The app bundles, I guess all, everybody here has heard about it. Everybody knows what's an app bundle? Not many people then, I guess. Okay, uh, yeah. If you don't know what that is, uh, I think Google I at the Google I.O. they talked about it. But it's basically a way in Android Studio you can say this is an app bundle. It builds other things that it uploads to Google Play. And then Google Play delivers those and kind of either builds an APK on Google's side and delivers the mixed APK or potentially even split APKs are so served uh, to the client, uh, to the device that basically can manage on newer devices that know how to manage split APKs. But basically, we could not do that either because we have offline distribution. How many APKs are gonna, these guys are gonna install? That requires, again, API 21 or more, which we didn't have, and it also needed us to give our keys to Google, which for an app which claims security, it's a little, uh, maybe not a good idea. Uh, there are other issues that also were basically stopping us from using that also. In all this, basically, we came up with something. We felt like we need to invent something. And that was our solution. Basically, we ended up designing a binary format uh, to hold the strings. And it just holds the strings. Everything else continues to use the Android resource system. Uh, I was well versed in internationalization, so I made sure paroles are well supported, all that stuff. Linguists are very happy with, with the format, stuff like that. They can put anything in it. We're not going to. Uh, it's not, it wasn't designed by somebody who doesn't know uh, the actual linguistic requirements. So, so plurals work well. And any, anything else, you can, your diamonds you can store traditionally in the Android resource system doesn't break that. Uh, and even sometimes you find some strings, you need the strings to uh, continue to exist in the Android resource system. That can continue to be that way. So for example, the name of the app, which is referred in the manifest file, that thing needs to be able to be findable by Android because the, uh, what, what do they call it? The, the app that kind of manages other, your, your screens and stuff like. Launcher? Launcher, yes, yeah. So Launcher basically needs to be able to find that from your APK, right? You cannot re move that somewhere else. So that's one. But maybe you have some widgets that are here or some library that relies on something. So you don't need to put all your strings in the string packs. You can just put some of them there. And uh, right now it doesn't work like that for us, but basically because it's a binary, usually per language, you can also download it on demand. Your APK doesn't need to include it. We now include all of those because they don't take too much space after this optimization. But if you want to, you can just basically only ship a few languages and let's say anybody think any, anything else is downloadable on demand if the user switches to that language. Uh, the binary itself is, uh, Language, I mean by, by language, I mean programming language independent. It's a simple kind of binary format. Uh, we wrote uh, basically a packer for the format in Python and a reader in Java because that's what we kind of needed and it solved our problem. Uh, we're thinking about doing more. Uh, the format is MMAP friendly uh, in a way that you can only, you only need to read parts of it when you need. Uh, you don't need to 
basically load the whole thing in memory into some data structure in order to find a single string. If you want a single string, you can basically go find it in the, in the file format, just lo load that part. And this is an idea I kind of borrowed from true type fonts. True type fonts were designed for, uh, I think, 68,000 architectures, pretty old architectures. And they were kind of designed in a similar way that people could just like uh, go to the part of the file they need, only load that glyph they need. Uh, so this is, uh, borrow some ideas from that. Uh, it also supports both UTF-8 and UTF-16. As you may know, some languages are more optimized in UTF-8. Of course, uh, European languages are like that. When you get to Chinese, Japanese, Korean, they're more optimized in UTF-16 size-wise. So uh, we can basically do either. Our Python reader, Python packer, basically tries both of them. Tries once with UTF-8, once with UTF-16. Whichever was smaller just chooses that. And uh, the, another idea which, which we found very useful is instead of uh, kind of abstracting the idea of a string away, saying that, okay, like, like Android. Android says, okay, this is a table of resources. And in each cell, you can hold a string or a number or something. And if it's a string, okay, this is how you, you, you uh, basically store strings, right? And uh, traditional string, all that stuff. We kind of thought, okay, we know these are strings and there are properties that can help us uh, improve the situation with strings. One is a pool of characters, basically. So uh, the way the format is designed is there's a large pool of characters is every time you want to add a string to it, you first see if that string exists as a substring somewhere in that large pool. If it does, that's, that's your string. If it doesn't, you add it to the end. Uh, your pool is slightly increased in size, but it helps a lot with when there's some sharing. And the format supports multiple locales per binary. So if you have Brazilian Portuguese versus European Portuguese, they're similar, uh, a lot of the strings are. So you can probably save a lot of space by just putting in the same file. Czech and the Slovak also very close languages. Some words are identical. You can just basically uh, say, okay, pull these together to save to try to save some space. The format itself, uh, I kind of uh, refer to it a little. There's basically three headers. There's some header tables, and then the pool I described. So. The header is, okay, this is the list of locales, this is the list of strings for each of these locales, and then for each of them there's some pointer. It says this uh, string starts here in the pool and, uh, and this, is, this is its length. So it's, it's a very simple format, and as you can see, you can already see how it's immappable. Let's say you want a language and you have an ID, you want to find the string. You search in the first header, you find the, where that language lives, the strings for that language live, you find that table, you find that ID, and then you just go seek, basically that's exact a string in the file that you want. So it's, it's very good uh, for, for that reason. And as I said, the string pool could be any format. Right now we support UTF-8 or 16. If you find some magic format that saves extra for your language, uh, sure, use that, and then your reader can do that. Uh, the packer basically minimizes this by avoiding repetitions. There are some uh, very simple ideas, basically, is, uh, as I said, you just, I first try to find the string in the pool before I add it, but we can probably improve it by like trying to put the larger strings first. We haven't tried all the, the, the simple ideas yet, and it, it saves us already a lot. Uh, but the, the thing about the, that pool of characters, kind of, uh, that pool of strings I told you about, is it's very compressible. Even if I had just added a zero for example, at the end of each string, as opposed to doing this way, all those zeros would kind of some, put some hiccups in, in the way of compressors. Or let's say I ex stored the length at the beginning of the string, like Pascal does or something, that number, which is of kind of a different nature, would not compress as well, for example. So some of these choices have really helped us uh, compress uh, the, the data pretty well. We've been shipping this, uh, since mid-2018, very gradually, we moved all the strings to it. And this seriously decreased our RPK size. So 12 megabytes was a very good win. This is a recent measure. I basically compared all the strings that we've moved to string packs if they were just in Android, using the Android system. Our WhatsApp business app, which is a little larger, has more strings. We saved 14 megabytes there. Uh, and there are, there are good numbers out there. You may have uh, similar versions of those in your organization basically showing that 
reducing APK size affects not only affects number of users, it can affect the growth. So it may affect the second derivative of basically your number of users uh, any time you, you, you save something. We basically, by Miguel's insight, my, my boss who's sitting back there, we decided to open source this. Uh, Gorav and uh, another engineer at Team Eider, uh, decoupled a lot of the, the code I had kind of written, which was very WhatsApp specific uh, in a couple of months. And so this has been uh, open source, it's on GitHub, you can use it yourself. And we think uh, if you don't already have such a solution, and if you cannot use some of the fancier solution I told you about, this is very, very useful. Uh, I mean, it, it made us very happy. Uh, future plans, uh, we, we can use our, our help, definitely, uh, if you're interested in any of this stuff. Uh, and, I mean, if you can help, definitely we're going to be there for you in code reviews, all of that stuff. So don't assume... Uh, you need to do all the homework yourself. We can help design and stuff like that if you want to help with any of this stuff. But something I'm, I'm focused on right now is uh, complex plurals, for example, which Android doesn't do well. You may know that, uh, for example, in Russian, uh, one apple and 21 apple. So it's, uh, I don't know the Russian word for, for apple, but basically for one, 21, 31, and something else, you keep the singular. You don't go to plural like English does. So this is some, something relatively simple. That's normal plurals, and Android handles that fine. But you, when you drop the number, for example, the rules change. So when you say, uh, I, um, hmm, let's, let's say delete message versus delete messages, the rules suddenly change, and in Russian, Russian rules become like English rules. There are edge cases like this, which I'm basically trying to uh, properly implement, which Android doesn't do right. But ICU, which is a IETN library, handles well right now. So I'm working on such features for this format. Um, the format itself can be more compact. I already uh, threw out some ideas. We can do some fancy compression techniques on it, which we're working on. Uh, it's a little uh, complex to use it right now. Right now, basically, there's some Python uh, parts, some Gradle parts, and basically some Java parts. It's, we, we're trying to integrate it better so it becomes simpler to use. It's not that hard, honestly, to use. Uh, but if you already have a large project, this is the, the, the funny thing about it. It helps most when you have a large project because the more strings you have, the more it's going to save you. Uh, but if you are starting a small project, uh, you can just easily hook that in, assuming you're going to grow. It's not gonna take, two, if your app is not too crazy, doesn't do something very crazy, it's not that hard to integrate it either. You should be able to, with not much effort, just integrate it with your large app too. Uh, but we want to integrate it to make it much easier uh, to use for everybody. And then uh, our present packer, as I said, is in Python because that was easiest to prototype in. Uh, we're probably going to replace it with Java or Kotlin or maybe uh, Gradle. Uh, that would basically make things more integrated. If there's interest, we can also do readers in other languages. I don't know if there's maybe C++ uh, reader or anything else that's interested in it. And the, the other thing is right now, although the format is MMAP friendly, we actually don't use MMAP in our reader right now. Right now, we actually load the whole thing into a data structure and memory. So but that's easily changeable. So that's another thing that we're going to uh, work on uh, pretty recently. And, and that's all, right? We're, if you have questions, we're at your service, right? Yep, happy to take questions. Yep. Free beer. If not, you can go home. <laughs>